Welcome to First Presbyterian. My name is Joe, and I have the honor and privilege to be able to call us to worship this morning. So I ask that you please stand as we read the word of God this morning. It's found in the book of Psalms, chapter number 70, verses 4 and 5, and it says this. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you this morning and we just thank you, Lord, for another opportune time to come together to worship and praise your holy name, Lord. Father, as the psalmist says this morning, Lord, we are so glad that we have salvation in you, that through Christ we are bought with a price, and it's not anything that we've done, but it's because what Christ has done for us. And we are just so glad that we can gather and worship and praise your holy name, Lord. Father, we just ask that you bless our service. We just thank you for this time, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we continue to worship. We will be sharing a verse from Hebrews chapter 10. It starts in verse 19 where it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Join us in singing the chorus. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the city.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought. i 
Thank you so much for just this day, Lord. Thank you that we get to come and just sing in your presence and worship together as a congregation. Please prepare our hearts as Pastor Jew comes to share the word with us. And thank you for an opportunity just to sit before your throne and learn at your feet. In your most heavenly and gracious name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, read from God's word. Last time I preached, I challenged you to bring your Bible. Raise your Bible up. If you brought your Bible, raise it up. That's awesome. All right, what if it's on your phone and you're going to look at it while, while I'm preaching and reading, right? So the encouragement is to bring your Bible, bring your phone, but then look at it as we're preaching and not just like put it away after I read. All right, this is God's Word. Apostle Paul, inspired by the Lord, says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol you, extol Him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Someone's already praising the Lord over there. You hear that? So by God's grace, you guys know the Jews are the original chosen people of God. But also, by God's grace, Gentiles are non-Jews who are later added into the family. That's a big praise. Why? Because most of us are Gentiles. Historically, these two people, the Jews and the Gentiles, they hated each other. And in verses 9, last part of 9 and 11, the Apostle Paul teaches a togetherness, a unity in worship that both Jews and Gentiles are to glorify 
God. And so we are to glorify God. That's why we're gathered here this morning. And so he quotes from several places. He says uh, from Psalm 1849, I, the psalmist being a Jew, will praise you, meaning the Lord, among the Gentiles and sing to your name. You see the, the togetherness. Quoting uh, Deuteronomy 32, 43, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, his people being the Jews. So again, you have the Jews and the Gentiles together. Quoting Psalm 117, 1, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the peoples, meaning Jews and Gentiles, extol him. And this oneness in worship, even though they hated each other, even though they were very different, this oneness in worship is based on what or who? Like, say it like you know it and are confident. What's the glue? The glue is a Jew, right? The, the glue is Jesus, yes. Blah. All right, so Acts 14, 12 applies equally to both the Jews and the Gentiles. There is salvation in no one else besides Jesus. By becoming a servant which it mentions in verse 8, Jesus opened the door for each group, each people group, to be reconciled to him. Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man, meaning Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Philippians 2, 7 through 9, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus and his servanthood all the way to the cross, that's the glue between the Jews and the Gentiles. And he's also the glue between us. And so the point is, what we're doing this morning, every time we gather together is work for worship, and corporately, whether it's on Sunday morning or any other time, it's primarily not about you and God. It's about us and God. And that, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. But here's the point that I want to make. As a church, I feel confident that we are unified in what we believe. That God sent Jesus to save sinners such as us. And I'm also confident as a pastor of this church that one of the huge blessings is the DNA, the ethos of this church, that we have a genuine care and love for one another. Anybody sense that? And I I know that when the elders meet and receive new members, often we ask them, well, well, why are you wanting to join in fellowship with First Pres? And it's, it's not unlikely for them to say, you know, there was just a certain love and family feel here. And maybe you've said that to the elders yourself. But here's the thing, by the grace of God, there's always new people coming in all the time. And that means that we all have to constantly and intentionally reach out to those people and express that same love and welcome them into the community. Amen? So I'm going to challenge you to do, first I'm going to challenge you with this question. How many people in this worship space, in our church, do you really, really know? And I don't mean just like, hey, or shake their hands in the morning, but, but, but how many of them do you really, really know? And here, here are some challenges to think about, some ways for you to expand your church family, because that's what it's about. And so here's the first thing. First of all, periodically, let's say once a month, sit somewhere different, because I know you sit in the same place. I tend to sit in the same place. But how about once a month, you sit over there, and you sit over there. And if somebody's in your seat, please don't tell them to move. (laughs) right? How about this? Periodically attend a different worship service. Sometimes we need to go worship with them, and sometimes they need to come worship with us so that we get to know them. Because how can they be family if we don't know them? How about this? Step out and serve on some sort of ministry team at the church. Because as you're serving, you'll meet other people from other places in the sanctuary. And as you're serving, you'll get to know them. Make it a goal every Sunday 
to introduce yourself to somebody you do not know. And again, not just putting your hand out, saying good morning, but actually having a conversation with them and asking them some questions and engaging with them. And definitely do not miss a joint worship service. You know what's really sad? Shame on us. Elders have decided two or three times a year we're going to have a joint worship service. We're going to have one on June 11th. It's one of the lowest worship attendance of the year. Why? Because we're all thinking about ourselves. Well, I don't want to go to that service because it might not be exactly like the one I usually go to. Blah, 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 blah. As opposed to, hey, this is an opportunity to get some, know some people I don't know. Now, I get it. For some of you, this is way outside your comfort zone. But what does the Bible say about God's grace? It's what? It's sufficient. And who knows, with God's help, maybe you'll make a new friend. But more importantly, maybe you'll get to know a brother and sister in Christ, somebody who's in your family, but you don't, you're, you're missing out. You don't really know them. I wish I could say that was the last time I'm going to meddle with you during the sermon, but it's not. In the rest of our passage, Paul goes on to explain why the Lord is worthy of this together worship idea. So first, it's because of his truthfulness. If you look at verse 8, throughout the Old Testament, God interacted with his people in his historic, redemptive love story through promises, promises to the patriarchs and promises to a lot of other people. In the garden, after mankind's rebellion against God, God promised a victorious Savior from the very, very beginning, right when we fell off the horse. Jesus fulfilled that promise through the cross and the empty tomb, defeating sin, death, and Satan. Through Abraham, God promised a great nation that would be a blessing to all the families of of the earth. Genesis 12, 2 through 3. Jesus fulfilled that promise by being God in the flesh who died on a cross to save his people from their sins. And that people was from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. Through Moses, God promised that if his people would obey his law, they would be his treasured possession. Exodus 9, 5. Jesus fulfilled that promise by keeping God's law perfectly. That was something that we, there's no way that we could do that. And then through faith, his righteousness, his obedience was transferred to us, paving the way for us to be reconciled to God our Father. Through David, God promised a king whose throne would be established forever, 2 Samuel 7, 16. Jesus fulfilled that. He became our king. He was in the lineage of David. Even now, he reigns and rules over our lives and over our world forever. The above promises that I mentioned were kept by God over 4,000 and some years. And so if God can do that... Certainly, he can keep all the other promises that are in uh, Scripture. Here's just some samples. Deuteronomy 3.1.8, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Psalm 32.8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Anybody else need that? Psalm 37.4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We love that he's going to give us desires of our heart. But what's the contingent about it? we got to... Delight in Him. Psalm 86, 5, You, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. To all who call upon you. Psalm 103, 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. From the east to the west, that's a long way. Isaiah 41, 10, has been speaking to me for a long time. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All we got to do is hold our hand, and he'll grab it. Help us through whatever challenging time. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Anybody else need rest? Romans 8, 1, There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for my power is made perfect in weakness. Seems weird, doesn't it? That God would be the strongest when we admit that we're the weakest. 
very different than our culture. Philippians 4.19, God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If you don't know these promises, it's your own fault because they're all over the place in God's word. When I read God's word, I circle his promises because those promises are what really minister to me. Why is the God of the Bible worthy of our together worship? Because he doesn't just make promises. He keeps promises. Every single one. Second reason God is worthy of our together worship is because of his mercy. Verse 9. Initially, Jesus' earthly ministry was focused on the Jews. But very quickly, that shifted. And even, well, before I jump to that, so proof in the text. So Matthew 10 says this, uh, 5 through 6, Jesus instructing his disciples, he says, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, if he stayed there, guess what? Most of us are in trouble. However, the majority of the Jews rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah. John 1.11 says, Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Thus, after Jesus' death and resurrection, the disciples' ministry really pivoted largely from the Jews to the Gentiles. And not everybody liked that, even some of his disciples. But it was all part of God's original and sovereign plan. Genesis 18, 18 and 22, 18. God promised to bless Abraham so that his offspring would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Isaiah 45, 22 and 52, 10. Again, it is clear that the salvation of God was ultimately meant not just for the Jews, but all the nations. And in a word, God's salvation is about his mercy. Hear me, church. God is not required to give his mercy to anybody. Let me say that again. God is not required to extend his mercy to anyone. But everyone, including you and me, including the Jews, including the Gentiles, desperately need his mercy. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Our rebellion against God, our wanting to do it our way, causes a rift in our relationship with Him. And what we justly deserve is His wrath and hell and eternal separation from His goodness and His grace. And when Jesus died on the cross, He became God's mercy in the flesh. And he paid the penalty for the sins. And he kept God's law perfectly. Again, something that we could not do. And he did that willingly, and he did that, be, he did that and because he was perfectly innocent. He did that of amazing love and amazing grace so that we could be reconciled to our Creator and our Heavenly Father. Now, you may be thinking, Pastor Drew... Yada, 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 yada. Tell me something that I haven't heard before. In fact, I've heard this a thousand times. I hope you hear that every Sunday you come here. Because we need to hear the gospel over and over and over and over. Why? Two reasons. One, we forget. <laughs> because it's so counter to our flesh, and it's so counter to our culture. But also we need to hear it over and over again because it's that good. Our God loved us so much, He sent His Son to die for us. My second response is this. Our core sin is minimizing our sin. Let me say that again. Our core sin is minimizing our sin. We love to play the comparison game. We think, we may not say out loud, but we think, you know that person that's sitting next to me in worship? They're worse than me. Now don't look at them. Don't look at them when you're saying that. 
Or we quickly think of somebody in the community and we say, you know, I'm not like that. Or we think about some famous person that we've got to know on social media, which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I'm not like that. Instead, we need to be comparing ourselves to God. You know, we talked about how holy he was. We sang about how holy he was. We need to compare ourselves to God's word. We need to compare ourselves to Jesus. And when we do, we receive a rude awakening. It's like getting hit with cold water in the face. Don't you see? Minimizing our sin minimizes God's mercy, which minimizes our worship of the God of mercy. Why is the God of the Bible worthy of our together worship? Because we're big sinners, (laughs) And we have a big God who's brought us the gift of even bigger mercy. Third reason God is worthy of our together worship is in verses 12 through 13. The word hope is mentioned, two, I think, three times. So you guys know that I'm married to Pam, my wife, and it'll be 35 years this coming summer. And you're thinking, man, there's an example of God's grace, right? Right off the top, right? <clears throat> So if I have never spent any time with Pam, if I don't know Pam, never hung out with Pam, and I say this, I hope that when I ask Pam to marry me, she's going to say yes. What is that hope? It's wishful thinking, is it not? It's like pie in the sky hope. However, if I spend a bunch of time with Pam, we hang out, and I discover that, you know, she likes me and I like her, again, grace of God, and we have common beliefs and core values, and we hang out together, we, we enjoy uh, one another, and she likes the activities I like, then when I ask her, will you marry me, the hope I have that she's going to say yes is what? Much more likely. Why? Because it's based on reality. It's based on experience. Hoping in God is very similar. It's justifiable. It's supportable. In other words, when we hope in God, it's it's rooted foundationally in who He is. What the Bible says about Him. Not us making it up, but what does the Bible say about Him? It's rooted in His promises. It's rooted in His gospel. It's rooted in our own personal experience with Him, yes? But it's also rooted, if we're together in this, it's rooted in each other's experience as we share what God is like and what He's doing in our life. Now, I'd be the first to admit that life is hard. And suffering and heartache are real. And that the trajectory of our culture is anything but godly and holy. Amen? It does not look good. And all of this can easily lead us to not have hope, to be hopeless and to be discouraged and to be full of despair. And all of this can also cause us to medicate on false and counterfeit hopes. Things like other people, even people that we love. Things like situations, things like social media, there we go again. Things like money, things like pleasure. All those things may give us hope in the short run, but they will all disappoint. And so the question is, if you're leaning on those things for hope, how's that working out? Because I don't see that working out very well. In contrast, from God's Word, we know that He is good, and we know that He does not waste pain, and we know that nothing and no one can get in the way, can thwart, that's a great word, isn't it? Everybody say thwart. Nothing can thwart His plan, His perfect plan. We know that nothing's too difficult for Him. We know that ultimately He wins against evil, and that's a really good thing. Why? Because we're on God's side, and if God is victorious, then we are as well. Hear me, church, all of that should give us a tremendous amount of hope. 
So because of Jesus, the one from the root of Jesse, verse 12, there is no sin that is beyond God's forgiveness and mercy. There is no hole that you have dug for yourself that God cannot rescue you out of. There is no addiction, disease, or sickness that is beyond God's care. There is no brokenness that is beyond God's restoration. There is no financial need that is beyond God's hand of provision. There is no wisdom needed that is beyond His ability to give. There is no weakness that is beyond God's help and strength. There is no disappointment or disillusionment that is beyond His grace. There is no discouragement that is beyond His encouragement. There is no anxiety and worry that is beyond God's grace. There is no grief or sadness that is beyond His joy. Why is the God of the Bible worthy of our together worship? Because He's a God of hope. And the text tells us in 13, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not any hope, it's abounding and overflowing hope. It's like splashing all over the place, hope. First question of our denomination's shorter catechism is this, what is man's chief end? In other words, what's his main purpose? And the answer is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Again, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Together worship, what we're doing this morning is one of the main ways that we glorify God. But together worship is also one of the main ways that we enjoy God. Glorifying God and enjoying Him forever should involve both our heads and our hearts. And really, they should feed off each other. The more you get to know God in your head, the more it ought to splash into your heart. And the more you get excited about God in your heart, it ought to drive you to want to know more about God, which would be the head. So, brothers and sisters, how would you describe your glorifying and your enjoying God? Is it ho-hum and stoic? Or is it excited and bubbling over and enthusiastic? As I was preparing this passage, I just couldn't get away from verses 9 and 11. There speaks of praising God and singing to Him and rejoicing and extolling to the Lord. The Jews and the Gentiles, everybody is caught up in doing that. I told you I was going to meddle again. Sorry, that's what pastors do. In corporate worship, when we gather together on Sunday morning, you are the time for worship. Do you ever smile? Do you ever nod your head in agreement as God's Word is being read or God's Word is being proclaimed as you just take in how awesome His character is? Do you ever say amen and hallelujah? But is it because the pastor had to coax it out of you? Right? Do you ever like bounce and sway and dance and tap your foot? How about this one? During a non-prayer time, do you ever close your eyes because you're just overwhelmed by God's glory and majesty? Do you ever raise your hands even, even in your pockets? Hear me on this church. My intent is not to be legalistic about worship, not to be pushy, not to make you feel uncomfortable. My intent is to encourage you not to be restrained by tradition and certainly not by what other people think. When we're worshiping God, we should not be worried about what other people think. We should be worried about what God thinks. Amen? Instead, if we're worshiping God and your heart is moved, let it out. Let it overflow. Let it bubble. And again, that's not just on Sunday morning. That's any time because we shouldn't just be worshiping God on Sunday morning, right? We should be worshiping Him on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. God is worthy of our help our heartfelt, together worship. Because of what our head knows 
and loves about him. Because he's truthful, because he's merciful, and because he's full of hope, abounding hope. Pray with me. Oh, Father, we rejoice that we were not your people, and now we are your people through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace and mercy and love. Father, we thank you for your truthfulness. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. Father, we thank you for the community, the family sense that we have. Father, help all of that to impact our head and our hearts, that we would bubble up with enthusiastic, together, heartfelt worship all the time. Father, that we would fall more and more with the lover of our, more and more in love with the lover of our soul. And then as we bebop around this community, Father, on Monday, Tuesday through Saturday, that we would be just be oh, so much overflowing with your Holy Spirit that people that don't know you, they would, they would sense, boy, there's something different about that person. They're excited, they're enthusiastic about whoever they're in love with. And Father, that you would open the door, give us a boldness to tell them about Jesus Christ, to tell them about the greatest love story ever told, to tell them that we are yours and you are ours. And all God's people said, Amen. Please stand to receive the benediction. Uh, Please stack your chairs. Pastor Drew will be down here if you have any questions about Jesus or to talk um, or for prayer. That's what we're here for. And so receive the blessing this morning. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Holy Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen.